Hey, this is Pietro from the UK. Ciao, as we like to say. Uh, welcome to a new episode of The Independence, where we host some of the cream of the cream of the world of independent watchmaking. We haven't covered uh, many Austrian watchmakers so far. So today with our host, co-host, Johnny McElleron, our editor from Ireland, we're going to host a gentleman, Robert Pankenhofer, who is actually in charge of one of the most fascinating projects in the world of independent watchmaking. And it's, I'm talking about the Austrian watchmaker, Karl Sushi and Zerne, as you could obviously guess from the introduction to this uh, uh, broadcast. So without any further ado, I'm going to have Johnny next to me, appearing, popping on my right, in this case, left of your screen, and Robert Pankenhofer from Vienna uh, it, and from Karl Sushi and Zerne. Welcome, gentlemen. How are you doing? Hi, Pietro. Hi, Johnny. Thanks for inviting me. It's really a pleasure to to be online with you and uh, hopefully many uh, collectors are joining and uh, interested uh, people to answer all your questions you might have and to tell the story about uh, Karl Suche and Söde. Excellent. We do our best. We do our yes. best, Johnny. My, my first uh, uh, comment uh, before leaving you the word is uh, 200 years of history of Karl Suche and Söde and uh, Robert is looking, is looking rather great huh, for, for, <laughs> for that sort of age. Yeah, well... Uh... <laughs> As I always say, you know, we try to keep uh, carrying on the ashes, uh, the fire and not the ashes. So I try to be live and kicking and um, to work um, and restart a company with such um, a legacy. It, ca uh, it really keeps you young, at least at heart, you know. <laughs> so uh, it's really refreshing your soul Absolutely. and your heart your mind um. absolutely absolutely uh, johnny how uh, you know we know the story we know the drill uh, johnny as our editor uh, joined the limited edition back in uh, 2015 <laughs> so it's been a it's been a fair while johnny <laughs> and you've always been you are the one man that already in the at the beginning of the 2000s you got passionate about independent watchmaking far before it became the trend that it is now and austrian watchmaking has a little niche has a role to play, and uh, how did you uh, how did you discover about Karl Sushi in particular? That's actually a long story because it actually goes back to the, my uh, introduction to uh, uh, independent watchmaker, or or should I say, the first independent watchmaker whom I knew personally uh, is a, a wonderful guy and still a great friend of mine called Mark Eugenie. And Mark is, uh, had his own brand uh, back in the mid-2000s, uh, uh, Jenny Watch. And uh, he, he created these just really beautiful pieces that were different to anything else that was on offer. And um, so I, uh, uh, I was drawn to uh, independent watch making through, through Mark. And uh, so whenever I heard that Mark uh, was working on this exciting new project uh, in uh, Austria with, uh, with Robert, the Carl Sushi name was being reborn again at that time. This was a, a new name to me. So uh, I, I, I had to uh, do some uh, investigating and find out what was what was Carl Sushi and uh, surprised to find that it was it, this was a 200 year old uh, company or, or that at, at that time an almost 200 year old company and uh, so uh, it, it was great to see uh, the brand being revived and uh, fantastic to see uh, my friend uh, Mark being involved with it and uh, nice. Nice. because there aren't many independent watch companies in Austria. I think there's one other I know where that we would all know is Ebring and uh, Absolutely. Uh, Richard and Maria. Oh, and, exactly. Yeah. No, and um, I mean, Mark, uh, I'm really glad that you start the story with Mark because uh, without Mark, I could not have uh, done uh, the, the, the project. Uh, he's such a, he's not only a great watchmaster, but really uh, just a very sympathetic uh, guy. And when, when I approached him, uh, very like uh, timidly in a way uh, and very respectfully. Um, I think what uh, draw him also uh, to our project was it's not another Swiss brand. So it's really a Viennese legacy. It uh, has a, uh, a legacy 
I have here, for example, a, a pocket watch uh, that uh, Sigmund Freud was uh, carrying. And you see the original logo, wow. uh, Vienna, Prague, and uh, La Chaux de Fonds. Uh, so when I ma approached Mark, it was really a challenge, you know, that uh, based on this like 200 year of uh, legacy uh, to to rebuild a brand basically from scratch because there were, was hardly any archive there. In the background, you see some some historic pieces that I now, of course, collect or um, yeah, for we, we, we'll zoom in again. Yeah, we'll, 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 we'll move in again. Yeah. But the challenge was really to uh, for Mark and also for our design and for me myself uh, to you know, Karl Suchi was purveyor to the Habsburg court, not without a reason, because back then he was one of the most innovative, uh, radical entrepreneurs in the watchmaking business. And he was very um, international from the start with the bases uh, in Prague, Vienna and La Chaux de Fonds, uh, with the pocket uh, manufacturer by, uh, in La Chaux de Fonds. So this kind of Viennese elegance, Swiss precision was already in, uh, ingrained in the DNA. And... Um, but he, he was a super innovative uh, guy, uh, aesthetically, technically, uh, at, at, at its best. And uh, of course, when I restarted, that was my challenge too. You know, to, we want, I wanted to be at the same level. And in that sense, I think Mark uh, is playing uh, an amazing uh, role to, uh, to, to achieve that. You know, uh, at the same goes, of course, to select a very young designer. Uh, cutting edge uh, designer who had never designed the watch before, but with the, the guidance and with the briefing and with the total immersion into this kind of Viennese lifestyle of uh, elegance, of uh, Viennese modernism, uh, turn of the century, uh, etc., it, it was possible, I think, uh, what you see today to build a collection where there's a, there is a, there's a clear um, design language. Uh, clear aesthetic and ethic uh, about uh, the brand uh, after you now running even so the the collection is uh, quite differently from uh, the watch uh, you uh, that you you showed in the beginning with the Belvedere, our latest release in in uh, geneva a couple of weeks ago with the waltz and of course the table uh, which uh, is handcrafted here in vienna and they just have the one of the the movements here just a naked movement a skeletal movement uh, we have uh, developed here uh, two years in the making. And uh, yeah, it's uh, with a young Viennese watchmaster. And uh, it's just fantastic. And uh, it's, it's, it's funny. Just a little episode and then I stopped talking again. But I, I had visited my dentist. And there's a small watch store next to my dentist. And it's always closed. But today it was open. So I enter. And uh, he was venerating uh, watches. I asked, do you have historical Suke and Sönne? Yes, I have one um, just uh, in uh, the renovation process. But he also showed me a book about, it was like the publication of the Habsburg watchmasters. And just in Vienna, we had like 5,000 watchmasters just in Vienna. So in the yes. Habsburg Empire, there were yeah. like thousands of master watch uh, makers. And uh, yeah, and uh, I... I, I'm super happy and proud that um, that we can continue this kind of uh, history. No, uh, yeah. Excellent. To put things in perspective, and we have uh, discussed about this with uh, with Johnny many a times in the last five six years of live sessions. Uh, watchmaking was a far more inclusive uh, business industry back in the days, two hundred years ago, as a middle European, you know, name. Uh, uh, I, I, yeah, I, have a, I have a middle European name as well. The Austro-Hungarian Empire uh, comprehended parts of Italy, uh, obviously Hungary, parts of Czech Republic, Austria, etc., etc. And it was really the heart of Europe. And in those days, one of the favorite objects of the crowns all across Europe were fine watches, whether it was in France, whether it was in Britain, where, whether it was in yeah. the Austro-Hungarian Empire. So. What, how much and what of this uh, legacy are you trying to, to transfer into Karl Sushi and Zerne these days? Well, to give you one example, um, and uh, the table clock, um, everyone told me, hey, Robert, you're completely crazy. There's one table clock in the market, Atmos, that's still selling. Uh, no one else, uh, no one will buy you a table clock. Uh, but for me, as Karl Suchi was so famous for uh, the big clocks, uh, I even have a model for a tower clock uh, in, in the archive. So uh, for me, of course, it was like a must uh, to develop a table clock. 
uh, even though there was no commercial, you know, planning and market research, etc., behind it. But uh, the, the mere fact that I am able to work with a young female watchmaster who graduated uh, from the watchmaster um, master school here in Austria that was founded by Emperor Franz Joseph. It's uh, I had to do it, and now you know uh, we are already in the second edition, and we have sold uh, three pieces to uh, Swiss collectors. But <coughs> uh, the table clock is also in in Paris, is also in Tokyo, um, and this gives me this makes me uh, proud. But it's also you know again you know to carry on the fire. I didn't want to re draw a historic clock. I wanted to do a clock that's really fit for the 21st century, and it's uh, like a pièce d'art, no, like a piece of art. Yeah. Okay. Yes. So would you, say, from, would you say this piece is the is the bridge between the past and the and, and exactly. the present? Absolutely. And also from uh, the the collection uh, with the wristwatches, the aim was, uh, of course, you. I didn't want to repeat the past, but my question was okay. Where did the old Karl Suchi stop? And that was in the Biedermeier, uh, like design-wise, technologically, etc. And so what came next? It was the Viennese workshop, like uh, Vienna 1900, with all those famous, um, you know, creatives, uh, but also industrialists uh, like Adolf Loos, uh, uh, musicians, uh, Schoenberg, etc. Like an amazing creative um, uh, space. And uh, in that sense, we decided okay, uh, let's take uh, Vienna 1900 as an inspiration. And that's how, for example, the Waltz number no. one is a very reduced design language, but of course with an emotional kick, with a creative kick, uh, with, uh, in that case, the second dial. Excellent. Okay. Just if I could pause uh, the conversation here, we have a question from uh, a, a, a real aficionado of, uh, of clocks and clock making, uh, uh, Thomas. Uh, who has asked us, uh, may I ask, what was easier than you thought? Re-establishing a brand and what was much harder? <laughs> so, which did you find more, more the greater challenge? Well, um, where should I start? You know, I mean, this is uh, when, I, when, I, when, when I started the, the project, I was not in the watch industry at all. I, not, I was not collecting uh, nothing, but what always uh, was driving me since I'm a young man was uh, to create uh, something out of nothing from like a, an idea uh, you have just in your, your head and then suddenly it's all there. Uh, in, 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 and uh, I think Pietro knows that my background is in diplomacy, actually. Uh, I was working as a trade commissioner uh, for, Austria, for Austria, and my second background is uh, the arts. So I'm uh, still a curator, um, curating design exhibitions, art, artistic festivals like Vienna Art Week, and that's my background. So for me, I, the, the hardest part, hmm, how should I say? Honestly, the hardest part, and I was not aware of it, is uh, as a diplomat, but also as a curator, I was used to connect with different people, to enter different industries, uh, but also, you know, to work with creatives. But what I did not know is uh, that no one made it for a new brand, in a way, uh, in the watchmaking industry. And uh, to have uh, this kind of um, lack of a network, you know, to people like retailers, uh, media uh, experts, uh, you name it, the whole cluster that you need uh, to, to build a brand. I thought that would have been uh, much easier. I thought everyone was waiting for me, and not even in Vienna this was uh, this was the case. Um, and uh, I'm I'm happy enough now after the sixth year that of course you built this brand slowly, and um, with the momentum right now, uh, it's really nice mm -hmm. to. But that was the hardest part to build this kind of uh, network of, of, of. If I may say. Robert, you did a great job because uh, actually what transpires today from a Carl Sushi is exactly the um, the balance that you stroke between working with some of the uh, amazing master watchmakers, Mark Jenny, some of the most reputable suppliers, if I can uh, uh, mention Vaucher, for example. Right. And at the same time, uh, uh, focusing a lot on the quality, on the finishing, but... Uh, not losing track with the affordability as well, because you come across as one of those elegant, fine, contemporary watch makers 
that also give uh, a chance to the watchmaker that is starting his watchmaking journey, uh, collecting journey, uh, because uh, your collection starts at a very interesting price point. Mm -hmm. um, for, for sure, <laughs> for sure. Uh, I think it's a lot of uh, value for, for the price we are, we are offering. I want to mention another challenge uh, just um, quickly uh, for, uh, for our guest. Another challenge was definitely, you know, a watch master always thinks about, okay, I have to build a, a watch that's really precise. But a designer always thinks about, I, I want to make it more beautiful. So, for example, to do like a second disc or now with the rotating date, um, to adapt movements, etc., according to the design language, that uh, is also quite a challenge. Uh, in the case, for example, of the table clock, it was, and with all the three models now, all the three collections, it's basically a three, at least three steps until you get there. So it's uh, it's another challenge. But um, I, I would have one question to uh, to, to um, the guest. Uh, which which watch is he wearing today? <laughs> Thomas, 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 I'm sure you'll get back to me and let me know uh, very okay. quickly. Yeah, um, he may yeah. be he may be surrounded by clocks today. You know, yeah, if, I, if he has a clock, Thomas, yeah. I would yeah. say he's wearing a langer, perhaps. Um, okay, well, yeah, at least yeah, yeah. And it's, uh, I've seen he's been posting a lot of images of uh, uh, he, yeah. He, he, uh, let him tell us. I'm sure he would be on to us in a moment. To, okay. uh, yeah. That, uh, so for the 1200th anniversary, and congratulations to uh, Carl Zushi himself and uh, and to your 200 efforts, years, Pietro. Uh, yeah. 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 What did I say? 1200. Oh, my goodness. <laughs> You're kind of changing the history of watchmaking or only yeah. about, about uh, you know, 200, 200. <laughs> so, uh, some secret archives. <laughs> <laughs> the launch of the Belvedere collection in this um, in this uh, uh, in this occasion, uh, which has had a great response. I know it because I was with you in Geneva, uh, and I when I saw it for the first time live, uh, I was impressed, and so were most of the people that were there. And we have the answer from Thomas as well. Yeah, nice one. <laughs> Congratulations. <laughs> Wunderbar. You have a long and Söhne, you need a such and Söhne, you know? So Yes. <laughs> so okay, so uh, how, how, cri how critical, how strategical is the Belvedere, uh, which again, uh, for me, it's a great, great uh, timepiece at a just a, a very, very good price point with a sparkle of orological ma magic because this turning date in the middle is something really unexpected and very, very uh, clever. And really exciting, and I, I bet there is the hand of Mark Jenny in that. Uh, Mark Jenny and uh, Milos Ristin, our designer, yeah. And of again, me, me, the in between uh, who, who tries to, gui uh, to guide it. But um, the Belvedere for us is, uh, I think, a um, very important uh, milestone uh, again. Uh, why? Because, okay, um, first of all, with the Vals, it's a very elegant wristwatch, a dress watch, a very classic. Uh, high-end uh, watchmaking with the Vaucher movement. Uh, with uh, the Belvedere, we wanted to complement uh, our collection and also become a little bit more democratic with the price point. Uh, and in that sense, also to offer a more bolder a more casual uh, vision uh, from the house of uh, Suchi. For us, it's very important. And we see the momentum uh, we, we get right now. Uh, basically, the first... Uh, production run for this year is uh, nearly sold out oh. and uh, and for, for us this is like a really a great response uh, from our collectors from our retailers we're really happy with it and um, um, it also you know when it, for example now being approached by retailers during the first years of course with the Wilds number one uh, they would say hmm, you just have one watch basically no even so we offer the different colors. We offer the amazing skeleton uh, vials, but but still, we, it was less attractive, of, of course, for for some of the top retailers. Um, Chrono Passion, Laurent Picciotto believed in us from the start, yeah. and um, that that was very important uh, for us uh, to get this kind of sign of approval. But now with uh, the vials, with the Belvedere and the table clock, I think we we can offer a really very nice uh, collection. Uh, not only for the collectors, uh, but 
especially also for retailers that and retailers, uh, you know, there's a trend to, to get out of retailers and just sell directly. I think um, I love our retailers. Um, we have a few retailers, but uh, we really love them and appreciate uh, really their, their work. Uh, it's fast. You great. have some very, very uh, highly respected retailers. As you mentioned, Lauren Picciotto, you have uh, Noble Styling in uh, uh, Japan. You have Pietro. Yeah, uh, yeah, yeah, and, uh, yeah. Yeah. and uh, it, so it, it, it's yeah, the, you, you've, you, you're in the certainly in the right doors, that's for sure. Yeah. And yeah. Uh, and now, as you say, with Belvedere, uh, Carl Suki has a portfolio that is uh, so, so you, it, it's more than uh, one uh, reference exactly carrying, carrying uh, yeah. the brand's reputation, and uh, yeah. It's beautiful. I, I, I think the Belvedere really, it, really, really impressed me. Yeah, I, I agree. I totally agree. And uh, as you know, we have already had some success with some good sales to some of our customers. And uh, I look forward to see when the, the pieces will uh, will come will come to fruition. But I think Robert, this piece in particular really sums up the legacy that uh, Carl Sushi has, the direction that you have, fine watch making at an affordable price, and your personal signature as well, because the art, the contemporary art touch is something that transpires as well uh, from the design of the of the watch. Thank you so much, yeah. No, it's it's uh, it's interesting uh, to, to see the reaction, but because in, in a way uh, from from the from the from the front, it's still this kind of Viennese elegance that, that we try to uh, to achieve, of course, you know. Uh, but then uh, with many little details, and then you turn it, and uh, it becomes quite baroque with uh, the engraving, the micro engraving of the uh, uh, palace, uh, the Belvedere Palace, which uh, sits uh, just across our showroom, and even little details, for example, here, the imprint uh, on uh, on the on the on the wristband, it's uh, the, the Belvedere garden, the Baroque garden, a few from above. So a again, you know, many, many little details that um, the old Suki, there's like when he applied to become the purveyor to the Habsburg court, people said, no, uh, he's utmost uh, behind every detail and no clock leaves the atelier before he hasn't signed it off. And for example, when, when we uh, did uh, for the for the table clock the, um, to wind it, uh, again, you know, it's like little details to skeletonize not just our movement, but even uh, the little key uh, here, and that's that goes um, also for the for the for the vials. Uh, for example, again, you know, we have uh, drawn some design inspiration from this famous American bar, uh, the Lowe's bar in the center of Vienna, where you have um, again, you know. The, the wristband with the ornamentation uh, from the ceiling and the of, and the and uh, the rotor is not the rotor is not a rotor is a waltzing disc isn't it <laughs> <laughs> exactly yeah the, the rotor the micro rotor and uh, I mean I think uh, Peter you have one of these no uh, that we did uh, um, the, the day and night uh, with the rotating uh, disc and once a minute it closes the, the yeah, we sold, yeah we sold it as well yeah. Yeah. It's a great, great piece, great piece. And uh, so we, we actually also do have a couple of uh, close-ups of the uh, of the movement as well of the the Belvedere with, as you mentioned, uh, the Baroque uh, wow. engraving of uh, wow. the famous uh, Belvedere Palace. Very good. And, yeah. Yeah. Uh, and just to give an idea, I uh, also there there's what it's based on. Yes, uh, exactly. Yeah. yeah, yeah. That's the it's just uh, just across the street from uh, where I'm sitting right right now. And uh, are your offices similar to that? Then are they like are, are, you, are you in a palace or as well? Yeah, that, uh, that would be nice, but I'm not a prince, unfortunately. Uh, I'm just a very ordinary ordinary Robert guy. Uh, I'm sitting in a basement uh, <laughs> uh, <laughs> uh, office, uh, unfortunately. But uh, when you come, I give you a, a guided visit to this palace. And we Fantastic. have some nice coffee and sacher torte in, in, in the cafe over there. Oh, I Brilliant. love I love a sacher. I love a sacher. Johnny, what's your assessment? I mean, when you look at this image that you're just sharing now and the story we've told, and uh, you know, last but not least, the fast uh, the fast system to replace the strap as well that looks really, really well done. 
yeah. from this uh, uh, shot that you're sharing here. Uh, a little over four thousand pounds, Johnny, for a for a Belvedere. No, six, to uh, Ah, uh, four thousand pounds. Uh, pounds. Pa yeah, sorry. Yeah, of course. Six in uh, Swiss francs. Uh, you want to repeat the price? Six thousand four hundred. Six thousand four hundred uh, Swiss francs, Johnny, to dive straight into Austrian watchmaking legacy with this kind of uh, uh, level of making, level of finishing, with somebody like Margini involved. Uh, what's your assessment? Yeah, uh, very high quality movement. Uh, CSS twenty two or two two two, I think. Uh, based on the Dubois Depra, yeah, based on Dubois the Dubois Depra, yeah, absolutely, with a module uh, created by in house uh, by Mark. And that module actually rotates the uh, central disc, where you can see the date window at that point there is just at the eight o'clock mark. But the date disc is static, but the, the, the dial. The central panel of the dial actually rotates, so it moves around. Does it jump at the uh, at the midnight hour, or does it? Exactly. Yeah, it jumps at the midnight. And uh, if you want to, I can show you how this works. Why not? Why not? If you give me, yeah. Let's see. Here we go. Yes. So you can see the date window moving around the dial it's uh that's unique isn't it pietro very very unique and uh, you'll have to help me to understand one thing and i don't know if any other uh people from the audience has uh, the same doubt can we show the belvedere again johnny do you have a picture of the dial so the the one uh, of the month is the one always going to be there or it's going to change position as well no because you see there the number one but there are also two lines and one line uh, stands for at 10. so this is basically uh, showing the uh, 21st so to to make okay uh, i see yeah i see, I see. Uh, so uh, at 12 uh it will be one and just the one but then it moves yeah. one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, nine. Yeah. and then there comes uh, these uh, lines involved that uh, one line stands for uh, 10. Yeah. Uh, wow. and, uh, that's how we complement the, 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 full, uh, the full swing. So the, 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 the day date is always in the same place, uh, so to speak. It's basically the dial that is rotating, showing one, uh, one uh, numeral or another. Um, and do you, do you skip the 31 uh, at times? How, how does that work? Say it again. Or you just correct. Uh, for the for the months with different uh, different okay, number yeah, of days, yeah, yeah. there's a skip it. Uh, that there's this little pusher that you can adapt uh, to the. Yeah, so you you can you can uh, correct yourself. Exactly. Very cool. Very cool. I haven't seen uh, anything of this like uh, before. Um, yeah, Jizzy Ninja, thanks for for tuning in. Um, question for you, Robert. Um, that's incredible. Does moving that disc require a lot of torque or power? Uh, so does it influence the, the power reserve, um, the mechanism um, itself? Not too much, but uh, not too much, but but still at the power reserve, uh, um, um, it's uh, 43 hours. Uh, it could be better, perhaps, yeah. Uh, but uh, it's uh, not too much. The, the, it's more, the, the more complicated also with the second disc is that it keeps like... Uh, stable um, statically uh, and that's where also mark adapts um, yeah the fixture of the disc so it doesn't uh, uh, move you know and i guess yeah i guess like you do you, it, it's not going to affect the the energy reserve so dramatically because yeah you either have the, the date disc revolving or you have the, in your yeah, case, it just, the, it just moves it just moves. It just moves a little bit uh, uh, each uh, each day, so it's not that much energy needed. But still. yeah, it's once a day. It's once a day, of course, and also it's an automatic, uh, an automatic timepiece. Yeah. Which, uh, for my standards, you know, if I'm wearing an automatic piece uh, for as long as I have 48 hours power reserve, I'm uh, I'm absolutely I'm absolutely fine. Uh, yeah. Very very clever and very well executed. So, is this a collection that is going to expand in the future, Robert? Uh, what do you imagine? Uh, well, uh, 
Yes, but you know, it's uh, always difficult if you just launch a new yeah. collection to already talk about plans for the future. But, uh, but I, a mile of chance, Pietro. <laughs> yeah, but I, 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 we always try to get the hidden gems, the hidden secrets, you know. But <laughs> you are allowed to say no, Robert. Feel I promise free to you say some, no. Uh, I promise <laughs> you some exciting stuff. Uh, I saw some something for next year that it's really. I, uh, there's a German expression, uh, really geil. Um, it's really geil, yeah. But I, I, I don't want to talk about it. It's, it's a collection yeah. that is here to stay. It's a collection that is here to yes, stay. Uh, will be a, one and, of the pillars. Uh, yes, and uh, we're going to... Um, the Belvedere will be, uh, of course, uh, declinated. Um, and uh, material-wise and uh, color-wise and also complication-wise. Uh, but I cannot talk um, uh, more about it. But um, uh, we had like an exciting uh, session just last week uh, with uh, Mark and uh, Milos. And um, I would love to have them already, you know. <laughs> uh, and also what's important uh, that uh, also, uh, you know, the Vals number one, uh, also there we plan to uh, update and uh, especially the case design, uh, but not only the case design, we're going to yeah, develop uh, the vaults uh, further uh, to include uh, more complications. So uh, ah. we are working with uh, Roche and Mark uh, and Milos, uh, and I just signed off the, the case design. Um, this is one of the best uh, matte finished uh, cases uh, yeah. and, and the seniors and uh, curvaceous, uh, you know, design as well. I, it's really, really one of my favorite. Uh, yeah, thank the you. Case of the, of the walls. I mean, the, the design here, uh, as you mentioned, uh, the Adolf Loos, this famous designer and, and, uh, and architect uh, around Vienna 1900, he, his, his claim was ornament is a crime. So uh, he, hello? Yes, yes. yes. Okay, I, somehow my, my computer was done. Um, ornament is a crime, uh, Adolf Loos said. So he achieved uh, the emotion and the elegance by combining different materials in a very seamless way. Uh, and uh, if you look at the valves number one, the connection from the ladder to the steel, from the bent up uh, dial to the glass, it's all very much seamlessly. And that gives uh, this kind of it's, it's it's amazing. It's minimalistic, but it's very rich. It's yeah. very, very rich. It's very contemporary. And so very classic, no? So yes, yeah. yeah. And you also did the skeletonized version too. You well, yes, the skeleton I love really. And also, again, it, the idea was uh, you know there are many skeletons that are a little bit fussy, uh, if I may say. And uh, I wanted to have, to keep the cleanliness, uh, but then again the the modernity of this uh, cut up uh, uh, dial. And uh, I don't know if you have the, the skeleton uh, movement also. It's like just a, like a beast. It's yeah, here you go. It's like a beast. Uh, it's like amazing. Uh, we are doing 15 pieces this year. And uh, basically they're also uh, sold. It's, uh, so are, you, are you doing the skeletonization in-house as well? Is, uh, is Mark involved in that? No, no it's very much uh, Mark is involved, uh, especially, for example, the, the dial we had to like hand cut uh, at the beginning. Uh, now it's uh, very much uh, with our partners uh, at Roche. Uh, that we are, that is Roche. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Excellent. And you also That's are championing. Yeah, Mark, is, uh, you have uh, an, another young watchmaker there as well, don't you, who is... Uh, well, this is yeah, this is Therese, uh, Therese Wittmer. Therese and, Wittmer, yes. Uh, a female designer, uh, and she's doing our our in-house movement uh, here for the for the table clock. Excellent, excellent. So uh, it's uh, fantastic. So there is a, a little ecosystem growing. In it's an our ecosystem, uh, really. It's uh, and it's a very stable ecosystem, honestly, because as you know, with Mark, we have been like uh, doing this uh, now for since the start, uh, six years ago. And also the design, it's like we are a little family. We, we are a very small operation still, very, very super small. And, uh, but a very stable, uh, yeah, family in a way. <laughs> it's yeah. really a family business again. Excellent. 
Uh, yeah, you, you, the, the gold also, the, the gold is uh, not uh, the gold cases. I thought uh, with our golden past, you know, of v the golden Vienna, I thought we would have a little bit uh, more response. Uh, we just have one uh, interesting uh, order for gold, uh, blue skeleton in uh, yellow gold. Uh, we'll see if we, if we, if we can do it. Uh, we'll see. <laughs> But even, that's, even that's, the, the, the big, the grand marks, this steel is now very much uh, in, in, in demand. And, uh, yeah, yeah. Uh, much yeah. more. Yeah. yeah. But you can see actually from, uh, you, you mentioned the case, the profile of the case. And I thought looking at that image of the uh, vast number of one skeleton, that you can really see the flowing lines and the contours and how subtle the the curvature is on the case it uh, really is a, a thing of beauty it's stunning it's really stunning and it's difficult again sometimes when things are too minimalistic they lose they lose in a certain uh, rich uh, ness if you like uh, yeah. but here yeah I'm a, I'm a big big fan big fan um so for those that are connecting just now we are the limited edition we specialize in independent watchmaking which we uh, host week in week out an independent watchmaker of our liking uh, today we have the one and only uh carl zushi and zerne and uh, the ceo owner founder co-founder robert pankenhofer is here with us to tell us his story uh, if you have any questions feel free to put them here i don't know if where you see the questions but here in the comments um even if you're watching this as a recorded episode, because we won't hesitate to let Robert know and to get back to you uh, with any uh, details you may need. Other than that, you can find the brand um, listed on the limited editions uh, website with uh, every <laughs> item uh, wisely reviewed by our resident uh, editor, Johnny McElleron, uh, who takes, uh, makes, you know, the great effort and also he takes the pleasure of reviewing every single timepiece that goes on the, uh, on the platform. If you want to see any of the Carl Sushi and Zerne pieces, we do have a small collection here in London and we receive privately at the, uh, in Mayfair. Uh, you can make an appointment with me or one of our sales associates and you can even see and touch and uh, really understand uh, the extent uh, to, uh, to, to where this uh, brand has been able to go so far. Um, Robert, uh, at one point of your the development of Carl Sushi, you believe you are now. What is the big strategic plan, if there is, uh, if there is one? You know, um, my plan basically is, uh, again, I can I come back what drives me. Uh, what drives me is basically uh, to do... Uh, Beautiful things, you know, uh, and uh, to, to build up uh, this this brand uh, again to its uh, past glory, uh, that simply motivates me. But uh, it's not about, uh, um, you know, it's it's not about uh, neither my partner nor me. We, we started this project about, you know, to make, uh, to, 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 to get rich or something, you know. What drives uh, me was always uh, meaning is more than money. And uh, for me to, you know, to to build on this kind of legacy, um, Karl Suche and Söhne again, that uh, that drives me. And if, for example, uh, just today again, you know, at this little store and uh, seeing uh, a historic uh, Karl Suche and Söhne being restored for a collector uh, or attending a ballroom dance here in Vienna at the f famous opera and uh, someone comes up to me and shows me a pocket watch uh, chiming uh, the hour. Um, or yeah, or, or seeing our table clock, our new table clock uh, in, a, in in Tokyo uh, or in Switzerland. Um, yeah, also this kind of creative process with Mark and, and Milos that uh, gives me goosebumps, and I want to continue that. No, and there are many many, many ideas. Uh, you know, uh, we are taking really careful uh, steps to uh, to continue to to build the brand. It's um, we, we have not uh, like a uh, double or triple million uh, uh, budgets to, uh, to invest. So we really take it uh, from year to year. We have been growing um, every year. Um, I think we have many ideas for for keeping the collection uh, going forward. 
And other than that, um, just enjoy life, no? And I hope to come to London soon uh, for a little event. Perhaps we can uh, do it in the future and uh, and enjoy the watches and uh, absolutely people that absolutely uh, orders. I'm sure you'll uh, you'll enjoy as well. We may uh, be able to organize a British, uh, sorry visit to the uh, British Museum. Uh, they have the biggest. Uh, clock and watches collection in the world. The fact is that it's not really in the public area, uh, but uh, we can we can help and facilitate to organize a visit in the dungeons, in the secret dungeons of the British Museum. And uh, I'm sure that some Carl Sushi may pop uh, out, you know. Well, actually, the uh, in, in our archives, uh, it states that the pocket watch uh, manufacturer our, um, our atelier in uh, La Chaux-de-Fonds back then was catering uh, mainly to uh, Great Britain. Uh, you see? I'm, I'm not sure. sure about that. <laughs> I'm not sure. About I don't know that. if uh, if Johnny has the picture of the uh, workshop. Uh, I didn't get that uh, uploaded in time. We were just no worries, no worries. But if you go on the website, the Carl Sushi website, you'll see the picture of the uh, of the uh, boutique, the Carl Sushi workshop back in the days yeah. uh, in Vienna. Um, my question is: Is there a place today where where there's a there's a Carl Sushi um, a collection that is visible for people that may end up in in Vienna yeah. and want to see the historic pieces? Uh, in in Vienna, we have uh, at the uh, Hof uh, Mobilien Depot. It's like a, uh, a museum where all you know the, the the household collections from the Habsburgs are still being stored, and for big uh, bank uh, state uh, visits. Uh, the glasses, the, the table sets, etc., are, are, are kept uh, safe. And uh, also the Technical University uh, has uh, blocks from our side. But the biggest uh, Suki collection is actually in Prague or outside Prague. Um, a collector who not only collects uh, Karl Suki and Söhne, but he has the biggest collection. I was there, it was like, uh, wow, you know, it was like... Uh, 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 like uh, a drug addict in a pharmacy, uh, I felt like that, you know, in a way. And uh, just, um, yeah, th since the relaunch, basically every week uh, we get requests uh, for information on historic pieces. So people send us photos of pocket watches, big clocks, etc., and want to know usually what it's worth. The value. <laughs> uh, if we might want to buy it, and then my people will remind me, Robert, we cannot buy all those old uh, clocks and watches. We have to sell the new ones. <laughs> and uh, good point. Good the point. archive for us is very important. We, we need the archive no, uh, to, to build the future. Yeah. And, of course. Uh, so there, there, there are, uh, there's this one big collection uh, in in uh, in Czechia, and uh, but it's. It's a public uh, museum, but it's a very private. It's like a, li a little house, and it's full of clocks and pocket watches, etc. It's like a, it's like a magic world, you know. <laughs> Amazing! I mean, it's good. To, it's good to know. It's good to know. Uh, hopefully, we've given another interesting information. I can't believe the best part of an hour has already gone. I, I have to thank you both, um, Johnny, for organizing this, and Robert uh, for being our guest uh, today. I hope you. Uh, Whoever is watching this, I hope you're enjoying uh, the contents we try to bring on a weekly basis. And we promise we're going to have more about Carl Sushi very, very soon. Um, Robert, thank you very much for your time and for your uh, lovely company today. Thank you so much, uh, Pietro. Thank you, uh, Johnny. Hope to see you soon again. And uh, yeah, um, your Belvedere will arrive in June, uh, Pietro. Um, I hope Can't you wait. enjoy them. Excellent. Can't wait. Super. Johnny, thank you very much and see you soon for the next adventure. All, all good. And everyone, thank you very much indeed for tuning in again and uh, uh, keeping up to speed with what's going on in the world of uh, independent watchmaking. Uh, I hope that you enjoy it as much as we have uh, enjoyed bringing these uh, amazing brands. And Thomas, uh, Dr. Thomas Brickdale, thank you so much indeed for uh, your comments and for participating uh, uh, once again and uh, so we will be back again uh, in another few days or next week Pietro absolutely there's uh, more in store for uh, for our lovely audience and uh, we will keep making the effort that we love we love making thank you thank you very much everyone see you soon bye thank you so much bye bye <laughs>